Welcome to the Learn with Lowell show. I'm your host, Lowell. Today we are joined with Jay Sarkar, who got his PhD from Stanford University in biophysics. He's the co-founder and former head of research at Term Biotechnology. He is now in stealth mode on a new venture. In this episode, we get into the philosophy of innovation, mRNA technology, and its application in the field of longevity, as well as some fun teas and hints for what he's working on right now. If you like this type of content, please subscribe, I'm putting out two to three new episodes every week, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you everyone thus far for liking, subscribing, and leaving comments. It's all been a lot of fun. Let's stay curious, learn about Jay in this episode of Learn With Lowell Show. All right, um, we were just talking previously and uh, you have, I, I we, were, we were having like audio problems like, oh, if you just uh, turn it back, turn it off and turn it back on, you know, reboot it, um, maybe it'll fix it. And you were telling me that that's uh, similar, that that phraseology comes up in biotechnology, which I thought was pretty weird, you know, like tech bleeds around here, but how do you think about that? Yeah, it's kind of very natural, right? So um, whenever you have any kind of AV problem or, you know, your computer freezes or whatever, the first thing you call IT, what's the first thing they tell you? Right? Reboot it, uh, <laughs> turn it on, turn it off, right? Um, there's, there's a reason why that logic makes sense. Um, whenever you get into, your, let's say you downloading a bunch of cat videos and you're streaming a bunch of stuff or you're you know running a bunch of uh, um, programs whatever um fundamentally your computer's still working right there's still um for programming that's in place uh there's still the logic and instructions in terms of how to do all those functions but as it takes on more and more processes it starts to slow right you you can think of your bandwidth or your queue filling up and then at some point it becomes so noisy in the amount of, of data it's processing that it freezes. But ultimately you don't have to re, you know, make the wheel. It's still there. The good information is still there. It just has this kind of noise layer on it. Um, and so that uh, really kind of resonates with a lot of what's coming out of uh, this information theory of aging, because you can think of the same kind of concept of noise uh, in the epigenetics and the cellular epigenetics. And uh, you know, you have maybe the core programming, which stays fine. You still, you don't have, neurons turning into cardiomyocytes, you don't have one cell type becoming another, uh, but you can have, see this noisy or dysregulated element that starts to build up, right? And so in the similar vein, um, if you had this functioning system, but that is bogged down with all these processes, yeah. problems and things like that, why not, instead of trying to erase all the information, why not try to reboot it and use the fact that it still knows where that, that proper equilibrium is. It knows that, that correct functioning state you just want to kind of revert it back to an older version or send it back to that earlier state. And that's what we do when re rebooting a computer, right? We go to an earlier mm -hmm. state. Majority of the computer is still the same as it was. And the same thing is what we now have learned how to do and are learning to do more effectively uh, with reprogramming. Yeah, it's, it's a great way to think about it. And um, that's definitely somewhere I wanted to start because communicating really complex ideas, like, you know, aging, you have like, you know, there's a paper I'm going to reference eventually about like the 13 different hallmarkers of aging. It's a really complex topic, but I think most people have had a problem where it's like they turned it off and turn it back on. And if they think of uh, a lot of the aging thing, there's uh, research that's going on. So basically, how do you do something similar to that? Like Yamanoff factors, do you want to like get things all the way back to like state? I know pluripotent cells, all these different things of like achieving the same objective. It's just, um, it's interesting to see how uh, like the 21st century is going to be kind of, if I always get my 20 first and 22nd century. I don't know what century we're in actually, but this century that we're in, it's going to be yeah. the, the century of biotechnology. But um, so I think I'm, I'm catching an in between a bunch of meetings and, and I, I always wonder when someone's at the cutting edge of innovation, how do you, when you're having like a tough day, you know, you're hitting something and it's just not working, you know, it's getting kind of irritating, but it's like, you know, you can't get irritating because then it makes it harder to think of things. How do you, how do you, what do you do to, when, you, when you get off of work or what do you do to like de-stress after a hard day or hard week? That's a good question. Um, so, well, I'll say it's a mix, right? So it, it's not like a binary switch that you can flip because you're always thinking about these things. You're always kind of obsessed, even if you're doing something to get your mind off of it. And I can speak to that. I, I do, you know, a lot of things in recreation. I like to volunteer a lot. I play tennis. I do other things like that. Um, but ultimately, I think the, the bigger trick, and it's also kind of a personal journey that I've had and, and kind of understanding is that, you know, the nonlinear path, is actually the most exciting one. We think that everything is going to work out as we planned, and you know, you know, these are all the steps in science or in life that I, you know, stage gated, and I'm going to reach this milestone, go to the next one, go to the next one, and I'm going to design a way, and it's going to work exactly. 
Um, if you have that philosophy, that's going to really limit your options, right? You're going to still try to shoehorn everything into the plan that you've uh, you've set out. And this is true for even designing a technology, right? If you really think that this thing has to work the way that I intended to, and it has to work in the same mode of action, same kind of um, methodology, it has to hit the targets that I'm thinking of, then you're going to probably blind yourself to the broader possibilities, right? Um, so this is where it's to me, it's even an element of faith. So, you know, I'm, I'm religious as well. And, and so it's, it's part of that aspect of trust that, you know, you may not understand the whole pathway, but understanding that there is a nonlinear path, you're going towards some great target, but appreciating how you're going across that, you know, that, that, that expands between your starting point and your end point, you can learn a lot. And so mm -hmm. when, yes, things will always get frustrating. You're always going to face uh, obstacles, uh, but Kind of that element of having that faith you're going to get there when you get there and understanding how something is evolving naturally um, can actually make it better, uh, better than maybe you even imagined. And so that's, you know, even with the reprogramming story, and some of the stuff that I'm doing now, it's not necessarily, I, I, that's not exactly 100% how I envisioned it, but it it evolved into what it was. I mean, I'll say even a case in point, I mean, Reprogramming itself, we we work with a failure mode of reprogramming. Nobody stopped reprogramming. They, they'd say, okay, push it as hard as you can, go as far as you can and get to embryo, get to embryo. And everybody was frustrated that it's so low efficiency. You can only get you know, less than a percent of IPS cells. So what do we do? What do we do? And, and so they try to make it even more and more. But we said, hey, what about the fact that on the way to reprogramming, you have this this uh, regime that's actually useful and, um, you know, appreciate that and appreciate how it evolved. And maybe there's use cases for that. And that's, that's what spun out this whole field that there's uses in those early steps in your nonlinear path. So mm -hmm. maybe it's a little bit philosophy, but, uh, that's what gets me through a lot of stuff, I suppose. Yeah. I think at a certain point when you're, uh, there's a, uh, there's a quote to some extent where it's like the difference between a master and someone who's just beginning is that masters failed a lot more. And so if you just kind of expect the failure and you expect you know things to not work out it's much easier than be you know allowing yourself to be disappointed if things don't work out you can kind of just see what is versus like being blinded by what you wanted it to be yeah well i i'd say maybe a slight version of that i i wouldn't say mm. expect failure so you should never expect failure you, you should anticipate you should be hopeful mm. and again you can you rely on faith you can rely on uh, yeah. you know your, your uh, colleagues whoever you you draw that support from uh but ultimately you have to, you can't hold it so tightly in, in that aspect, right? Yeah. You have to, you, you have to expect that it will, you hope for the result, but expect it to be different from what you anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a good caveat. The, if, it, if it's okay to ask, not like deep on the faith question, but I am generally curious. Sometimes people see faith and science as being these two divorced concepts. So I'm curious, how do you balance that? Yeah, I mean, again, there's different manifestations of of, of faith. There's so many different, uh, you know, doctrines. Yeah. There are ideas. There, the people pray to different things. Uh, but to some degree, it kind of naturally comes to me because, you know, I'm I'm if anything, I, I'm, I'm actually my background is physics, and I'm not a formal biologist in any stretch of the imagination. Um, but there's this element that I learned to appreciate even in my journey in physics of emergence, right? So it's the idea that you know. We in, in life, and I'll even talk about this in some of the technology and how, how I co approach some of the technologies in general, we think about things and try to reduce them. And we try to focus on, on specific aspects and try to control those specific aspects. Uh, but when you study, you know, that's one area of discipline that, that a lot of people will study and they'll try to do kind of this reductionist approach in biology or in physics, especially in physics, right? You talk about particle physics, the, the most fundamental elements of, uh, of nature itself. Um, but there's another school of thought, um, which is more about, and you've probably heard of chaos theory, you've heard of systems, mm -hmm. uh, dynamics, things like that, which are more emergence. It's not about understanding, it's kind of giving up um, the folly that you have to understand everything and kind of looking at the big picture and recognize that things, you know, have connections across larger scales. And there's a beauty that emerges in that sense, too. So in many ways that, you know, you could interpret that as, as one element of, of God itself, right? You know, the thought that it's not about dissecting or finding the, the little pieces, but the, the overall beautiful picture that comes together is this element of God and people interpret that in different ways. And so I think that's also now speaking to maybe what that means for technology. 
it's very, I think, um, important, and I think that that's a, a, a critical perspective shift that has to happen to recognize that biology is very much an emergent phenomenon. It's not, we try to reduce it. We try to say even in aging that it's because of this one gene or it's because of this uh, driver or something like that. No, it's a system. It's it's an mm -hmm. emergent structure that evolves. And, and even the epigenetics, you, you can say that is an emergent structure, but it's only one dimension of multiple structures and hence why we need lots of technologies. But that's the, that's the beauty of it. If you can appreciate that it is complex, then you can realize how to work with it, right? And this is, you know, we talk about, you know, macro concepts. So the easy one, you know, I always give an example. Think about the concept of temperature, right? So I don't try to understand, uh, you know, if I want to turn water into ice, I'm not trying to move every single molecule and reduce it to the positions of each of those. Mm. I raise this macro concept of temperature and I say that this is it's statistics, it's an averaging, it's, it's talking about the variations of states, but it is one now perspective that I can see the whole system and say, if I change that element, then all of those microparameters change to where I need it to be. And so part of that is understanding that if you let go of that micro aspect, you can discover these macro aspects, or you can discover these themes, these, these core modes of a, of a system and manipulate those. And so that, that was a lot of the motivation in the reprogramming as well to say that I'm not going to change any specific uh, methylation uh, of, a, of a gene promoter. I'm not going to change this histone or I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be looking at the overall epigenetic landscape and see how it wants to respond to different uh, states that it likes to be in, right? So we talk about the embryonic state or we talk about the uh, disease state or we talking about all these different states and how do we traverse that landscape and, and the reprogramming gives you some dimension of that. Yeah. It, it kind of makes me think of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Levin's work. He works on um, like bioelectricity, this, uh, yeah. like this, oh, you're, okay. Uh, yeah. I was like, oh God, I'm going to have him on. I don't want to like butcher it in the description, <laughs> but uh, um, it's kind of, the, you know, when people think about how am I going to regrow a hand? Some people think I'm going to genetically modify someone to have the ability to regrow a hand. But uh, my thought on something, some of the stuff that Michael Levin's doing, is like, what if we just create the conditions for a hand to regrow? And where the cells want to do it naturally on their own and it's the same thing you could go to the micro like let's mess with the dna let's like build something that can to manipulate it or can we just create the environmental conditions that the hand will like the tissue will just naturally start regrowing itself versus yeah. like even messing with the whole genetics of it i think that's a very powerful concept in and of itself and even more historical ones like parabiosis right so parabiosis is not you know trying to figure out uh, people are trying to do now and reduce it which i think kind of reduces some of the, the complexity or beauty of it. But original, the study is like, you know, Tom was a, is a good friend of mine and, and we, uh, you know, worked together, of course, on the reprogramming stuff. Uh, but I think we both appreciated that, you know, the work he did there was not about reducing it. It was actually about understanding how this greater signaling environment of the blood is able to establish youth versus, versus age, right? And the power really came from that you are exchanging blood and they're normalizing and it's an entire system that is maintaining the communication that exists, all the different cytokines and growth factors and all those molecules that are swimming in the blood. And so the beauty of that is one, he appreciated the complexity of that, that milieu, but two, and this is where the design really comes in, he found a simpler way enough to manipulate it, meaning just that exchange of blood. So we can, we definitely can design, you know, impressive things, but the elegance in what we design in terms of technologies is simplicity. But that simplicity has to be in tune with the complexity of the system. So if you yeah. can figure out a simple trigger for a complex reaction, that's more meaningful than trying to find a simple trigger for a simple reaction or a really complicated trigger for a simple uh, aspect of the system. Or even the, the, the most crazy thing, trying to control every element of the system uh, and micromanage it uh, as much as you can. Um, that I don't think that's realistic anytime soon. Mm -hmm. yeah, I spend um, some time whenever I'm having a problem or I see something going on in the world. And it's like, what would be like the one domino that would just start cascading the rest? Versus, huh. um, I mean, there's always great people that are on, you know on the ground doing all the work, but I don't necessarily have all, all the time in the world. So it's like, how can I come in and intervene at, in the right way that just dominoes it, and maybe a way that other people are either not doing to level I can help with, or that just a little nudge will affect the whole system. And yep. um, it's it's cr it's 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 crazy if you think with that mentality, how often you'll find 
those type of dominoes. But if you're not even thinking about that process, there's I, ever people who are uh, long time listeners will know. I call it like being a busy idiot when someone's like first time founder, and they're you know they're they're like I have so much stress, I don't know what to do. And they just start doing anything. It's like uh, it's like you know climate change. If you just do a bunch of stuff. It's like you know is it helping? I mean, it makes you feel good, but like are you actually like moving? Are you doing something that moves the needle in any way? Substantial. Um, yeah. yeah, and I I think. Uh, I think having that like North Star of like, what are you actually trying to achieve? And it sounds like, you know, it's a very similar process that you have. It's like, what is the objective here? Is it to move the atoms or is it to raise the temperature? If we're raising the temperature, we don't need, we can be, we're mindful of the atoms, but really we're mindful of the temperature instead. Um, Which like uh, uh, temperature is like one of those things that I think is uh, kind of fun for people who don't know physics. I mean, for you, this is probably like hearing someone describe finger painting, but um, no, that, that's that's beautiful. I think it, it should be. Uh, ultimately, this stuff should not be esoteric, right? It should be something that, like the example you gave about, you know, just domino effects. Even you could talk about in society and how to cha- change uh, mindsets and and you know yeah. social engineering. You can talk about uh, a mechanical system. You can talk about even your relationships with other people. How to? What are the pain points? What are the the elements that can change a mood or something like that? All of these are just principles that they, they expand yeah. beyond any field. If you, so if you had two doors in front of you, one, you could have a, you, you have a small effect on a big problem. So let's say like you could come in and increase the life expectancy of someone with cancer by like 10%, or you, the other one, you have like a Pandora box that has a material and you give it to people and it cures cancer, but you can never know how it works. Would you be able to live with not knowing? Basically? Oh yeah, that, that's 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 <laughs> okay. I think that that's you know speaking again with the initial themes. That's what we have to eventually move to. I mean, uh, yes, you know, for the the fundless, I, I will say that with full disclosure, I was into particle physics when I was in college, and, and that was I would uh, lambaste everybody who was not particle physics that say everybody else is just you know doing all this, stuff. but. Fundamentally, that's that's the realization that that I've come to that, you know, we're trained, whether physics or even biology, to be very reductionist. So, you know, I'm going to study this specific gene. I'm going to study upstream and downstream. Then I'm going to claim that it solves the whole world. Um, but, you know, it's very difficult really to, to make that assumption or, or to actually have real consequences as a result. So you're going to have to give up something, right? You always have to give up something to make that progress. So instead of, you know, that fine resolution uh, if you can give that up and understand the complexity of the whole system and, and and deal with that complexity, recognizing it'll be a black box, but being able to manipulate it between modes or states or what have you, then that is ultimately more meaningful in what you achieve. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that you know is is something that I'm philosophically, I guess, um, okay with and and, and yeah. actually embracing. Say, I think uh, I talked to a lot of scientists. I talked. To a lot of people of many different um, walks of life, and th- there tends to be, for some people, like a, like not to be mean to scientists, but like when they have PhD, sometimes they get really good at being reductionist, as we're talking One about. Area. But yeah. an- another way to think about it is like they're very good at like thinking about cer- uh, thinking about things in a very specific way. But yeah. it sounds like you have a very broad like uh, for many scientists that I know, like it's like a process to get out of that mindset of like even not even. Yeah, the whole mindset of it. So I'm, I'm curious, like, was it, how did you break that for yourself? Or is it just like always emergent in you to have that type of way of thinking about problems? Oh, well, <laughs> for a personal journey, yeah, there's there's yeah. a lot to it, right? So, you know, I, I moved from one field to another. And now, you know, yeah, I've even moved from reprogramming. So I, I, part of the, the ability to keep moving kind of forces that into you, right? So yeah. If you keep on challenging your comfort zone, if you recognize, like, I, you know, I've done all I can for this space, I need to now expand and I need to expand myself. If you constantly pursue growth, I think that will invariably, whether you like it or not, it will invariably change your perspective. You're going to get mm-hmm. more, you know, uh, vision on, on the broader aspect. In terms of then how to approach things, I think it's part frustration. I think it's also that too. <laughs> you know, we mentioned that frustration, you know, is kind of bad, but it's also kind of good. Um, it, it comes out maybe because I'm an outsider. I, I go into fields and I become the outsider and then I eventually get into them. And then once I feel like I'm too mainstream, I, I go to another thing. But that's that's the thing. When you're outside looking in, you really don't have time to enter the minutia. You, you should study, of course, what you need to, and you need to make sure you understand it correctly. 
But if you try to innovate or you try to design on that, you're going to be outcompeted, of course, because the people have years of expertise. But maybe you can look at the problem differently. And so you're kind of challenged for your own survival uh, to fundamentally rethink how you're looking into things. Um, so that's, I think, if anything, if you don't already have that mindset, and let's say you want to be you know, more diverse in your thinking, um, whatever your discipline, doesn't matter you know, if you're in science or non-science. Um, I'd say challenge yourself in different environments. Constantly keep keep uh, challenge yourself, and and you could still do it. If you, I you know I'm single, and and so I don't have to worry about you know being in one place or things like that. But even if you have you know location constraints or something, there's always things you can do. You don't have to always switch jobs or you know switch spaces. You can always try out different things and and at least expand your perspective on you know how things uh, exist in your field or even learn about other fields as well. And I think that's the mistake that people do. And maybe something more appealing to you now millennial generation, Gen Z, uh, where there is more liberty to, to learn about new things. And it's not such a big barrier to entry uh, to kind of enter new spaces. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense to me because, uh, I mean, the name of the show is learning. And that's like one of the easiest way to challenge yourself to to see new things is to just be curious and be like have a discovery type mindset. And uh, recently, but you, have to, I think you have to, I'd say you have to be kind of, again, with theme religion, but you have to be religious about it. You have to, because you're, the tendency is, because momentum, right? Momentum mm -hmm. wants to keep you going in what you're already in. If you do not reflect and say, okay, I, you know, I've done a lot here. I need to, you know, challenge myself again. Then you're just going to coast. You're going to coast and you might do well and things like that. There's no you know, lack of success, but if you are fundamentally looking to grow yourself, you're going to lose that after a while and you're going to be comfortable at it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it has, it's an active process for sure. Yeah. The, uh, recently I picked up like a, just a thick machine learning, like teaches you machine learning. And I don't know anything about machine learning and opening it up and reading and being like, I don't know any of this. I was like so excited because uh, sometimes when it's you fun. find a curiosity off of another curiosity, you have somewhat of a frame of reference. So it's like, okay, this is like this, like this, like this, like this. And this, and this thing is like, oh, if you don't know what I just said, hey, here's like a review thing real quick. So, oh, great. Now I can, you know, brush up on my linear algebra real quick and I go back into it. It's like, it's, it's, it's so much fun to look before something that I don't know anything about and, and know that if I just chew at it every day, just a little bit with everything else I have going on, that in a couple months or in a couple of weeks and in a couple of days, or even like by the end of the hour, I'll know things that I didn't know at the beginning. And just having like the complete new discovery is such a thrilling experience. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of curious for you, you know, when was the last time you had something like that? Or what are you currently learning and working on learning right now? <laughs> so I have to be a little sensitive about that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm still, uh, you know, uh, uh, was founder of Turn and, and you know, they're moving forward and things like that, but kind of in the same vein, right. Um, you know, Reprogramming is now an established space. So I'd say, well, it's not, of course, mainstream, but it is somewhat a, a discipline now in aging. And there are quite a few players, as you can see. And, and so I saw even myself that say, okay, well, this is a great idea. I've, I've worked on it since, you know, my thesis. It's, it's I don't know, almost a decade now. Uh, man, I feel old now, but yeah, uh, I've been working on it for a while and I was thinking, you know, I need to, to move on. I need to, I need to challenge myself. And there were other areas that I wanted to do. I never had a chance. So, you know, those are, you know, what I'm entering into now, I'd say largely, you know, I can't talk too much. It's a little bit more sensitive, but, you know, at the end uh, I can maybe give, um, you know, contact to, for people to reach out and learn more maybe on one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, but yeah, uh, the new uh, areas I'm, I'm very much uh, trying to understand are more about kind of this general theme about how do you, how do you engineer things so that they in, in inform or it invoke some form of logic or some kind of, regulation aspect, because I think that that is the critical thing. Uh, the epigenetics was really about regulating the cell. The epigenetics is the upstream regulator of the cell. And, you know, it, the approach of not thinking about every piece, but understanding how the pieces work together, how they're regulated with each other, that is very powerful. And there are lots of aspects of the problem, as I mentioned, uh, of how to how cells regulate, how um, drugs interact with cells, how solutions interact with cells, how the body interacts with each other. There are all these aspects that are very complex, but ultimately the trick is not to try to reduce the complexity or to handle one aspect of complexity, but to provide better regulation of it. And I think that if anything, maybe that might be the most meaningful aspect of, of aging itself is it's a poor ability to regulate 
or or stabilize a system, right? I mean, we talk about this, you know, fundamentally in terms of homeostasis in biology, but you can say in, in systems, this is equilibrium, right? If you cannot restore the equilibrium, there's a runaway reaction and you enter into a different state space. Same thing is true in biology. If you cannot restore equilibrium, you enter a different state space. We call that pathology. We call that disease, mm. right? So designing regulators, um, whether it's epigenetic or otherwise, that's, you know, uh, I think an interesting play. And there's so much to learn in that aspect. So, I, you know, right now I don't even focus on epigenetics anymore. I'm working at completely different aspects, but that's that's the cool part. You're, you're constantly uh, learning. You might have a theme you take in. And I think I wanted to you know, emphasize one thing you mentioned when you were giving the machine learning example. When you entered that space, when you first looked at that textbook, you're saying, oh, this looks like something I've seen before. And so that's the trick, right? You are not, even if you're entering a field you've never seen before, that doesn't mean you don't have any experience. That doesn't mean that you're entering blind. What means that is your experience is different. But as we were even prefacing at the very beginning, these are fundamental principles. So you can take principles across from one field to another, or one discipline, another, one aspect of life to another, and see how they manifest. And that really, you know, invokes clever new designs, new strategies, new technologies. If you're designing from first principles, then you're never short of ideas. You're never short of, uh, you don't feel like the odd man out because you're always bringing something to the table. You, you have something to, to provide. And then of course that grows as you move from field to field, you, you, build, you pick up new principles or you pick up a new uh, perspective on a principle and say, oh, that exists there. Yeah, well, that's the same thing in, in this. And so the reprogramming one, you know, um, I, I even talk about that as, as something called annealing. And, and we know annealing in biology, a lot of people use it where they do qPCR. But more fundamentally, annealing is with the process that you know, from ancient times, they would recover metals, right? So if you had a piece of armor, you go to some kind of um, uh, warfare or something and you get a bunch of damages on it, right? They wouldn't try to fix out every aspect of the, the armor they would just melt the whole thing and recast it. It's, it's a simple, dumb solution, but it's the same concept of this, this controlling the temperature to change the micro elements. So that comes from material science and you're bringing that all the way to biology. I mean, there's a completely different you know, ends of the spectrum, but that, that just speaks to that no matter where you go, there is, you always bring something to the table. And instead of trying to say, well, I don't know this, I don't know what I can learn from it. Uh, what do I, what, what, you know, um, what logics can I bring to this and how can I manifest it? I think that is a ripe source of innovation for sure. That's, that's how I do it. And, and the new stuff that I'm working on is very much bringing those logics. How do you think about concepts like feedback or how do you think about concepts like state and things like that? Yeah. I think the fun thing about the show is, is one thing that I get to interact with so many different people is you get to see how often there are commonalities in what it takes to be successful in terms of thinking and stuff like that. And, um, and, and you, you, sometimes people feel like if I'm going to do something in film, I have to like, it's a whole new set of skills. Right. And there's, there's to some extent that's true, but more often than not, there are, like, I almost feel like there's like a, like, like, you know, like Einstein, he wanted like a universal theory. Like the more people I talk to, the more there's like, it feels like there's like a thread that connects, like, what does it, what does it take to be an effective leader? What does it take to like break down a problem? You know, I talked to uh, Bob Langer. And I asked him, like, how does he choose problems? And this is for people who don't know, he's like one of the greatest biotech innovators of our time. And um, he said, like, I'd say much shorter than what you said, but like, you know, he's, he's, he's Mark Twain in a sense of like, he's had time to like <laughs> think of a very pithy answer. He's he been said, a while, uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he said to the fact of like, I just think, what's the problem and how can I do it better than other people with my team? And if I can do it better than other people with my team and it's the biggest impact I can have, then why am I not doing it? It's like the guy just never stops. Yeah. Well, for me, it's more what what's what's a fun thing to think about. I think that's mm. the, I, you can say, OK, you know, I have a problem is a new area or something that I'm, I'm studying. Um, first, I enter that space, you know, you know, like you did with your your textbook, you enter that space and then I try to comprehend it as best as I can. Right. So that doesn't mean that I'm going to just memorize all the aspects of it. I'm going to try to translate those aspects to things that I've studied before. And then, then you can iterate and say, okay, well, has someone thought of it this way? Like, like I mentioned, like feedback or something, has someone thought of it as mm -hmm. a feedback loop? There's, there exists a technology that can do this and, and you can, can visualize it this way. 
And if if there has, great, wonderful. Uh, but if not, then uh, you just keep going down the rabbit hole. It comes from the curiosity. So if it's fun, if it's engaging, it always, you know, typically something that's fun, engaging uses a little bit of yourself that you already are comfortable with and a little bit of the environment, which is new and interesting. And so that back and forth of, oh, I can see it this way. Does it look, exist that way? And then you look at that and, well, actually, nobody's thought of that. So what is the closest? It looks like that. Oh, actually, if I thought of it this way. So that that iteration to me, it's fun. It's it's mm-hmm. it's how you, it's like getting to know a person, right? You first look for the commonalities, then you look for the differences, and then you iterate back and forth. Oh, you know, it's like, you know, you can say it's like dating or it's like, um, you know, uh, making friends at, 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 a, at a school or, at, at, or colleagues at work, whatever. You try to find that common ground first, and then you expand on the nuances. And that's where all the fun is. As long as you have the nuances and the commonality, it keeps things fresh and interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, one, one thing, um, well, I think there, I think uh, Elon, he went from like being a part, like he was like, admitted into Stanford for a, a PhD, but then he was like, no, I'm going to go build rockets. But <laughs> I, you just keep, you, you know, you have the physics, but you actually finished the degree. You, you built, uh, you know, a, a company, but you're still staying in that vein. You know, I, I don't see you going where you are now to like build like a, a, thor- a thorium reactor or something like that. So is, is there something fundamental about biotechnology that keeps drawing you back to it versus, I mean, like we're talking about, there's probably an application of your mind to something else that could be equally rewarding, but I think it comes down to like what you find intellectually stimulating and, cur- and curious and fun to explore. Well, there's also, yeah, there's the, the psychological aspect and why I choose these problems. So, you know, there's, of course, I have flavors of transhumanism and, and those kind of things that motivate a lot of people in this field. I'm maybe a little bit more active about doing something about it rather than just, you know, investing in someone else to do it or like maybe like Elon or somebody. Uh, but yeah, I think those are the, the kind of meaningful problems to kind of, how do I, I'd say maybe more fundamentally, I have this rebellious nature, so I don't mm-hmm. like limitations and I don't like, uh, yeah, those I hate them too. so you can say the same is true about our biology is our first and foremost invitation. So yeah, I'm interested in the same kind of pathway trajectories that a lot of these people, are, you know, biology and aging. And then you can talk about the, the in silico approach and singularity and things like that. All of these are kind of interesting in the natural evolution of, of mankind and, and what we exist and, and what we want to work on. So yeah, there are a lot of great problems uh, that are you know definitely more power to the people working on them. But this is maybe part of the motivation too, that yeah, it's the personal kind of challenge, my own limitations and my own barriers. And maybe it's just all growth. I mean, that's, that's mm-hmm. fundamentally what it is, I suppose. Mm-hmm. The, um, when, you're, when you are researching and saying, hey, are there similes to my thought process? How do you validate, given the fact that sometimes in studies, when you, if you're looking at peer-reviewed papers, et cetera, that sometimes the results won't be the same if they run it again? So how do you, when you have an idea, it's like, oh, this is similar to my idea. How do you validate that idea out so it's not just an echo and actually something that actually can be built upon for a further idea? Wait, so uh, sorry, I didn't understand exactly. So in the case, so one question you're asking is, um, how do you validate that um, an experiment or a result is what you expected? And then the other question you're asking is, if you have a new idea, you're trying to say how close it is or what was, no, what was so, the uh, it's, it's all one question. I was given an example of like studies, but uh, studies generally sometimes, especially like, I think the obvious one is like social sciences, like it's like a crapshoot if it's going to be re- uh, re- reproducible. reproducible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when you're exploring these different ideas and you see something like, oh, this is similar to my idea, this is validated what I'm thinking, and you get 20 more, you know, five, three more papers that kind of uh, check that idea as well. How do you, how do you determine, or to what extent do you, do you need some level of certainty to know that that is something that you can build a startup or an idea or an innovation off of? You know, because like to some extent you can't go down every line like, okay, I'm gonna reproduce this result real quick. Like there, ha- there's there's some yeah. level of like there's trust there. There's, there's some level of faith there that someone did a great job. Um, but there is like if it's a, if it's a new area and you have no frame of reference, like how do you know when you have the frame of reference? Yeah, it's like a very so, meta question. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 practical elements to this, and then there's maybe the more fundamental element. I could I could maybe speak to both. So practical elements, of course, you can try to look, you know, in standard things. Look for you know well published journals. Look for uh, people who are uh, you know very explicit about their their methodology, or you know trying to, or, or if you, if you know somebody who directly works in that field, um, you know, reach out, talk to them, uh, try to understand more. 
Um, so there are those kind of practical components. And uh, of course, you can think, I imagine everybody can think of uh, ways to make it real that, that you feel more confident. But I'd, I'd maybe speak to something more fundamental in terms of um, when you design around principle, the principle itself can exist. Now, whether that manifestation that the specific experiment they ran or not captures it or not is, is a different question. The principle is a principle. Like, it, you know, I said in the example of feedback, feedback is a principle. Nobody's going to debate if feedback exists or not, mm. but they're going to debate if your manifestation really proves feedback or not. So you can say, okay, well, is it worth me going down this rabbit hole, right? So I saw, you know, a bunch of these results and is it worth me to try to build on them and reproduce and create some kind of uh, feedback loop or something? Well, the, I guess the calculus you have to do is, is your, is the core principle that you're designing around valid enough? Is it, is it valuable enough? Um, if you, it would, what would feedback do for this system? Uh, what would a reset do for this system? Um, these are all, you know, you know, ultimately what has to motivate you at the end of the day, because you may, what you're probably going to find regardless is that you go in to try to reproduce that you're not going to get hundred percent what you've seen there. But if you're very much principle motivated, then you're going to be trying to explore that system to see what actually more naturally fits into the principle you're designing. So, you know, the example we can say with the reprogramming, so, you know, we, we wanted to do reprogramming and this is, this is part of the story of how we got into mRNAs because we wanted to show the principle. We didn't really care about how to do reprogramming. We didn't care necessarily about which cell types to do. We wanted to show that this ability to reboot or re reprogram the, the, um, the epigenetics is more meaningful as, as a holistic driver of aging or a holistic driver of, of cell health. And so we initially you know, started with virus approaches because again, they're quick and dirty and they're very fast to prove a concept. Uh, but we had you know, so much issues with being able to control it properly and actually be able to show that yes, we have it on uh, for as much as we expected it. Because when you have a genetic construct, there are a lot of steps before you get to protein. And there's a lot of things that can happen that can mask the effect or, you know, give the cell a lot more control than you do. And that's what led us. So at that point, we could have said, okay, well, you know, um, this isn't necessarily working out. We can't control it as much as we liked. We'd really have to engineer a better system or something like that. Is it worth to keep going? And, uh, you know, you can think back to, but what is the core principle I'm trying to do? Should that principle be fundamentally valid? And we were so confident in that to say that, yes, okay, you know, this this idea of being able to reset, it, it kind of naturally happens. It's why reproduction happens. It's, it is fundamentally how nature uses these waypoints to get back to, to functionality. So yes, I, I'm confident. I have faith in the principle, even if that specific instantiation mm. is not worth it, that I am faith in the principle. So let me, instead of going down the rabbit hole, I'm still core to my principle. What other way, and this is where the nonlinearity non -linearity comes in, what other way could we go that makes it more organic or, or gives me a better option to reach this principle. And the big problem was control. I can't express it when I want and I can't turn it off exactly when I want. And some of the genes are expressing too early and some are expressing late. So there's a different pattern variation. And that's where we stumbled into mRNA. And, and of course, this is pre-pandemic, right? So this was a gamble. This is, and, and I'll also qualify, this was an academic in, uh, venture at that time. There was no there's no real thoughts of making a company or any of that. None of us had any interest. And I, you know, when I started this project and I was first thinking about the idea, I was just hoping that I could make a cool idea and then somebody maybe in, in the industry would make it one day. I never expected myself to actually become, you know, now more you know, entrepreneur type. Um, but I'm, I'm glad for the transition, sure. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, we took a risk on mRNA uh, because that was not a technology that was scalable at the time. There was, if we had initially plans to commercialize this, that would have been a complete, you know, um, additional hassle. And it kind of was early on too, because you're trying to sell the new concept, the new principle, plus a new substrate and a new modality. Um, so this is why, you know, I, I harp back and forth on academia, but um, one of the benefits of academia is that you do get to explore those things without that concern. Um, mm -hmm. I'll say in, in ideal cases, not always, but in ideal cases. And so we, we really believed in that principle. So we, we took that nonlinear path. We took the path off of the standard approach that most people do reprogramming and found another technology, which 
you know, paid off at the end because a lot more people became interested in mRNA for other reasons. But now it's such a big space for sure. But that's that's I guess that's the the calculus you have to run. I mean, do you believe in your principle enough? Um, and yes, there's a lot of data and things like that. But ultimately, if you're always trying to prove that principle with that mechanism, then that will give you dividends. I think regardless whether you know you actually achieve it the way you intended to, or or you achieve some other version of it, that is more meaningful chasing that principle than chasing the specific uh, application or specific instantiation. Hmm. That's a really That's interesting really uh, thought process. Yeah. I'm That's why if, if, <laughs> if you're thinking of an idea, start with the principle. Start with the principle. Mm -hmm. Think of what, what if you're entering a new space, try to identify the principle. You know, always you know, build up from there. Right? Yeah. I think that's a, a more loquacious, but also I think more succinct way of what Elon Musk says, which is like, oh, first principles. And I think I, sometimes I feel like people don't understand what he says when he says these things. And they're like, they just nod their heads, you know? It's like, oh, well, my friend's nodding. I, I you know, I understand it. But then the friend's like, oh, he's nodding. So I got to nod. Like, I understand it too. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, oh, actually, this is this is somewhat of a transition, but um, one, there's some listener questions. And uh, they have really weird names. So, like, if people could get, like, cooler names, that'd be great. But, uh, like, this person's name, I don't mean to disparage your name, by the way, the people who made their usernames. Um, this is about uh, uh, aging and epigenetic information. Uh, listener's name is Code Cody Newbie. Fun name. Uh, what is your reaction to the recent work by David Sinclair? This is a complete transition. Uh, what, is your, what is your reaction to the recent work by David Sinclair, which suggests that the loss of epigenetic information may be due to the upstream cause of aging? Yeah, the, um, there was oh. a recent his recent publication. Um, yeah, which it has quite a few authors, and they're. They're saying a lot, you know, kind of this this key story, which I, you know, I wholeheartedly, you know, support as well. I mean, it's it's fundamentally this thought that, and it's going back to the same things we've we've discussed. So it's not necessarily that much of a segue either. But it's this idea of entering uh, this concept of complexity and saying that, look, we're not trying to restore individual pieces. We're trying to understand. Um, now this information landscape and information is manifested in many ways, right? Epigenetics is, you know, a big one, but honestly, just one of them is, you know, you can say all the omics are examples of information on top of information and regulation is the thing that I would, I would stress also as, as the way to go about it, because you can have information overload. That's a term for a reason. We take mm -hmm. all the sequencing data, uh, we can throw a bunch of AI at it and things like that, but Ultimately, if we can't uh, understand actually, you know, some kind of principle in, in terms of ma manipulating it or some kind of regulation process that that naturally kind of uh, slides in or, or engages the way that this this information is regulated, then we're probably going to cause more damage than, than, than benefit. Right. We, we essentially pick one finger in the dike and then, you know, you have 10 other cracks and, and it's leaking, uh, you know, uh, in other places. So, and this is, you know, that's honestly what we've done for so long. We've been so focused on single driver diseases that that works for things like, you know, a virus or, you know, a bacteria or something. Yeah, you can focus, you can pinpoint it's that, that's the problem, get rid of it. Uh, but for these complex things, you definitely need to handle the complexity. So, you know, I haven't actually uh, read the, the new paper that came out, but um, I think he's, he's speaking largely and, and they're showing more examples, um, uh, whether it's a Horvath's clock or probably uh, showcasing some of the reprogramming stuff and things like that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, I'd say it is a core feature. I don't know if it's the end all be all um, it's, it's hard to claim kind of uh, absolutes in that sense. Uh, but it is, I think one important dimension. Uh, and to be honest, we're just scratching the surface. Um, again, it's not the area that I'm still in and I'm still focused on, but I'd say, you know, we have made great strides in uh, what we can manipulate uh, in terms of epigenetics. And there's certainly a lot to do in terms of expanding that space and um, appreciating uh, what we can do with it. Uh, so in all these aspects, you're hearing the same themes. It's, it's about control. It's about regulation. That's where the future is, uh, and I think, in this technology and this space. Mm -hmm. the, um, there was a paper on Turn Bio's website that they cited when they were talking about their, their science. And it was uh, a 2013 paper by... Lopez Oten, if I'm saying their last name, et al. And it outlined the, basically the hallmarks of aging. There was like 13 of them or 18 of them or something like that. 
And back then it was nine, about, I think. Yeah. Now okay, there's been. Well, more. I didn't write down yeah. the number. <laughs> there could have been number. I said it was it, more than three, and I'm confident on that one. Um, uh, it's been ten years since then. Uh, how do you think? How we think about aging has changed in terms of the how you see it. Like, is there like, do you have a divergent pet theory that it hasn't become in the zeitgeist yet? That zeitgeist yet, and and that. Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of what's hot now and 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 again no no disrespect to the, the previous work or uh, you know the areas that people focus on previously but i think what is becoming the trend is people are moving away from single target or uh single driver kind of approaches so you'll even see in the hallmarks the original nine or now you know as you mentioned they've added more and things like that but some of those hallmarks are very you know specifically driven you can talk about kind of the nutrient sensing one for instance it's it's very limited to certain pathways and and things like that um but now people are moving away from that uh, approach now you can say there were flavors of this before so in, in nutrient sensing you can go back to kind of caloric restriction right so caloric restriction is this broader uh, approach it's not just reducing it to a specific um hormonal pathway or a specific um, gene that you're upregulating, although people try to find, okay, wait, is, is it this, just this gene that will save and, and do the same thing? No, caloric restriction is about changing the entire metabolic profile of the body. And again, that's a system. That's a, that's a, there's a systems level intervention. And again, with a simple kind of, uh, approach, meaning you just change your diet and things like that, but ultimately it's doing a systems level consequence that you know, is, uh, shows reasonable benefits for, for, you know, reasons as we've discussed. Um, but now I think people are transitioning to hallmarks that are more, uh, you know, comprehensive or, or, or openly systems focused. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've heard other things about people talking about non-coding RNAs and, and the diversity there too. So that's the space, you know, you're entering into epitranscriptomics and modifications of, uh, transcripts and things like that. And how do you, uh, manipulate that? That's also speaking to complex systems. And I think what we're realizing is that we can we can define flavors of what drives things at a systems level, like we can say epigenetics, epitranscriptomics, or uh, you know, inf inflammatory signaling, extracellular signaling, these kind of things. Uh, but that's all great and dandy. We can write them down. But what are the actual regulators of those things? I know it's mm -hmm. it's kind of going back to that same thing. Uh, but yeah, that's fundamentally where we have to move. I think we're evolving in terms of appreciating that complexity, even, you know, David's paper about information, appreciating that, that complexity and information, but then how do you effectively uh, change the picture? I mean, you talked about, yeah, do you just do a small thing in a big picture or do you treat it as a black box and actually manipulate the black box? Um, that's where, if anything, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, uh, enthused about all the, the uh, visualization technologies we've had, sequencing and things like that. But I don't know if we're we're generating technologies at the same rate that handle the system as as fast as we are generating technologies to view the system. We can view it, you know, more and more complex, but solving it is still, I think, a little bit behind. And you know, for obvious reasons. Yeah, I hear a lot about a uh, single target. I think CRISPR, for instance, has been out for like what twenty ten. Like it's 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 finally like it's entering the second decade and we're finally getting the first two interventions using it. And I think they're, um, they're single, there's, they're like single codon DNA diseases. Like, uh, they're not like complex things, but even though the, the technology has been out for a while, the application is quite in the sense of like moving the atoms in a very simplistic way. Um, I, I, I to some extent have this, uh, running like hypothesis in my head that the, what we're going to do is not so much like, cure diseases is we'll build a the system to regulate uh rejuvenation and how diseases uh manifest so like every like year every like couple of years you just like go into this like rejuvenation area and they just like pump you with stuff and then like you're good for another, like five years or something like that and then like over time like i i wonder like to, to the extent like people will just like think like why do we even need to cure alzheimer's we we don't have we don't like even if we get it you don't get it you know because like we're able to like reset and stuff like that um which I think is a lot like how do you regulate the system? Like what's the, you know, uh, that type of stuff. But um, are there th are there things? Uh, another well, uh, listener question. If I may say ahead. one thing on, on, on yeah. that point, 
um, you know, that, that's not ruling out the utility of, of single yeah. target applications for it. I mean, exactly. The CRISPR application is, is an exact, um, you know, definition or a poster child of why that still needs to be in place. In their case, yes, they are targeting specific target mutations. And yeah, I would not suggest do a whole uh, systems level uh, problem if you know it is driven by that core mutation. Um, mm. And yeah, correct it, correct it. I, it. Go for Occam's razor, by all means, if you can. Um, but what I argue is that that's good in certain circumstances, but especially in aging, because of the way that aging manifests, it very much is a systems level. You don't get that liberty. So take the liberty when you can, but if you can't, then you have to have more clever solutions. Do you often find yourself in con uh, confrontation in terms of someone saying, hey, you're wrong and this is why? Confrontation, I don't know. I, I'm, uh, I'm very passionate um, mm. uh, in, in when I speak and I, I think you can, you can tell that. In terms of confrontation, you know, I, I really haven't faced that where people, um, you know, open. Not I, I'm not, if anything, I, I'm, I'm creating ways. I'm, I'm always focused on ways to convey a concept that is relatable. Right. Yeah. And I, I know I talk a lot. And so that's, that's part of it. But um, otherwise I think the reason why I, maybe I get into less conflict, you know, scientifically is that because I can speak to that that core principle that they already, you know, some degree, and then we talked about this, that they some degree come to the table with. Like everybody in, in general can can have that concept, of, you know, the, the reboot example we talked about, everybody's had to do that. It's, it's something that's very relatable. So if you, it also speaks to how well you understand what you've designed, right? If you cannot find a way uh, that it connects to something, now they can always doubt the result, right? They can say, yeah, I agree with the concept. It would be nice to do it, but I don't know if you actually did it yourself, or I don't know if this is the best way to do it. That's that's always the reality. I mean, that, yeah, and then then you can you know it's either you show the data, or you try to convince them, and if they won't be convinced, they won't be convinced. But in terms of the principle, I've never really got. Oh yeah, I don't believe in 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 feedback. <laughs> I don't believe in uh, you know mm -hmm. that you can you can uh, move between states or you can do something. These these are just you know. They're, they're realities, they're elements of our own reality. And I think if you start with that, that's an all, also a benefit for people who are entering the space. If they start with the principle, I think you can get a lot more people on your side. And then, sure, they'll debate you in terms of how to do it. Um, but the hope is that, you know, you come to some, some group think about how to actually do it. Right? Yeah, I think uh, often when I found myself in conflict where everyone has different opinions on how to achieve an objective, I have, I've said, like, all right, well, this is our objective. Let's just like recap what are our house in terms of how to do that. And literally just have everyone be like, oh, that's our objective. Because like sometimes people have, you know, they get a little attached to their opinions. And uh, and people are like, oh, that that is our objective. So then they like, before we're even done with like two minutes, like people have ruled out like 90% of it. It's like, well, there's usually three. And they have like the greatest uh, ability to affect the big problem, the big thing that we're trying to hit. Um, it, it, it it's, it's like North Star thinking. It's like, what is your actual vision? And it, it's somewhat hard to do, especially when you you, know, you propose an idea. There isn't an, if I say you say something, and I say that's stupid. It's like you you kind of want to defend it, even if it is like a good idea. You know, it's, even if it's a yeah, bad idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like I think like it's a bit of a muscle as well to have the strength if someone were to come in and say, hey, you're wrong, to like break it apart and think, you know, where they're right, where they're wrong, and how does that work to support or um, undermine the principle? And then does it you know do anything to the principle as well? Maybe there's a, a different aspect of the principle that I didn't see. Like I think. Often, the fun thing with science, especially if anyone's ever been sick before, uh, and this is like a, a kind of like gallows humor types uh, positive thing, but at a certain point, a doctor will start saying, "I don't know." When you're like, "Oh, why? Why am I sick in this way? I don't know." Like if you if you ask, well, "Okay, well your your immune system does this. Well, what why, what what about the immune system that makes it do it that way?" And they'll say, oh, "I don't know." And it's like, "Well, where would I go to learn about that?" It's like, well, "I don't know." <laughs> it's like it's like there's so many cool things that you get to explore. In yep. the sciences or in everyday life, like walk out your door, pick something randomly, and try to figure out why it does it that way. Like, why does a tree have uh, have needles versus broadleaf, and why why do the needles uh, survive over? Like, there's sometimes people are listening in, and they have so many different ways. There's some like people who like drive trucks that listen to this, which is pretty cool. Wherever you are, like, please comment. Like, I think that's pretty beautiful. That, you know, you move things around. Um, you're seeing things all around, and you have a curious mind. And I think like what we've been saying this entire time: if you have a curious mind, and you, and you apply things differently. Um, and you can reflect and not take things too uh, personal. I think that's a, a very powerful thing. We have touched on mRNA, CRISPR technology. 
What do you think is the, like the next step? Like, I don't think, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have CRISPR, for instance. What do you think the future is without, I guess, giving away what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the best way, yeah, I, I definitely, you know, we've, it's kind of beating the dead horse now, really thinking about r regulators. I think that's, mm. so in terms of what substrate makes it real, Right. I mean, uh, you know, there are all these cool new technologies. And I think there we have a lot more tools at our disposal than we had you know, 10, 20 years ago. And it's exponentially uh, increasing. Right. Tool development is, is um, amazing. The, the types of chemistries we can do, the types of genetics we can do. We can make things uh, now very well um, in terms of then how to make them meaningful. I'd say that's where you, you need to make. So CRISPR, we can take CRISPR, for example. Right. So CRISPR is exciting. Um, if you can take, you know, it, if you can recognize its strengths and weaknesses. So in all of these new tools we're developing, you know, as we mentioned, CRISPR is good for targeting specific uh, uh, mutations or specific errors in the genetic code and correcting those. So if you can tie your disease directly to that uh, without these concerns that it just increases the chance or decreases the chance, but it actually drives it, then that's a beautiful starting point. And then there are also realities to that, even in CRISPR, right? It does not work with every cell. It's not a you know, golden bullet that you can just put it in every cell type and it'll work. And it also has epigenetic aspects that it has to face. There's this other complexity. So in appreciating all these new technologies, and I'll say that with reprogramming, with, with all of these new technologies, realize that you know they come from a broad principle, but they are just one instantiation of that principle. And they need to evolve too to better cover that principle, and they will. Uh, but at the starting point, as you're building, you know, if you're trying to build an application or you're trying to build a solution around it, look at its strengths, look at its designs, and, and build around that. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of where where things are and where they're going, I'd say, you know, for that, you of course need to have a detailed knowledge of all of those spaces. So CRISPR, you can you'd have to understand a lot of you know specifically genetic diseases. You can look at orphan indications. Uh, you can look at you know those spaces where they really can narrow it down. Then you have to understand which cell types it works with well. Um, you have to understand also the delivery aspects, uh, the concerns there, um, the uh, the concerns with the Cas9. There there are other all these complexities that actually go into realizing uh, this technology. Um, but then if you're trying to do something dramatically different, you're just saying the next wave of what's going to happen. Uh, well, I can say that I'm not, I'm not a chemist, so I can't say what, what is going to be the novel new molecule structure or thing like that, nor am I a geneticist that I can say, okay, well, this is the newest way to, to change the code or things like that. Uh, but I can say to that general theme, yes, it's the, the cooler technologies. And, and you can say that, you know, it's a little overused term, but are the ones that are going to be platforms, Right. And how do they become platforms? It's not because they focus on an individual target. They may they may establish it with an individual target. They may show one prototype with an individual target in mind, but they design it thinking from the beginning that I'm going to create something that's broadly based. I'm going to create a principle. And then the principle with CRISPR, yes, I want to precisely, reproducibly, and, and, and uh, directedly manipulate this, this genome and you know it's even broader now. I mean, you can talk about CRISPR A, CRISPR I, where you're using the same precision in identification, but you're not just correcting; you're activating, you're inhibiting, you're doing other things with it. So they start with that principle, and then you can figure out what's the best implementation of that. Um, so then I would say, yeah, it's it's that that's why those are brand new technologies. So without talking too much about what I'm doing next, yeah, I, we think we're we're in that space as well. And in building um, new regulators, uh, I think that's that's where it comes in. And that it can be a lot of different spaces of how to build that regulator. And again, that's something that, you know, for people who are interested, I'd be happy to chat one on one. That's a little bit more sensitive discussion. Uh, but yeah, I think the space of regulators, bioregulators, um, that will be, you know, the future. How you can, it's not about just forcing behaviors, it's now about sustainably or controllably uh, engaging those behaviors. Outside of innovation and the technical aspects of what we're talking about, what are the hurdles in getting something built for you personally? Is it, is it, um, you know, for some people it's how to lead a team, you know, some people just really want to be the engineer 
and maybe like be an engineer and lead like how Wozniak was back in, you know, Apple. He never wanted to be a manager. He just wanted to build things and he kind of influenced policy in his very subtle way. But um, what are, what are some of the things outside of the technical that get in your way? And please, yeah. you know, no funding. <laughs> People always complain about funding. <laughs> yeah. Well, funding is always is fun. Yeah. But I think if you look, you have to in, in generating your story and generating your principle, um, if you really believe in that, and if you have a, you know, a good logic to what you're saying, then people are, funding should be, you know, it's still an issue, but it shouldn't be on the forefront of your, you, you yeah. can find funding, you know. You, Especially if you're back from Stanford. You know, so I shouldn't, yeah, I'm a little bit um, uh, <laughs> different from the, the average person, but uh, in general, I think if you can, if you can speak to the right people, there is that, but I'd say in general, that problem of finding the right people, that is, mm -hmm. that is, that is a real problem, right? Um, because look, we, and, and this is something that I kind of lament about education in general. Um, and, and you kind of touched on that when you talked about, you know, you keep on asking the doctor, the doctor will at some point say, they don't know. We're very much taught, um, in primary school and even in uh, college, I'd say, and, and maybe even some degree in grad school too, that things are kind of closed problems that, okay, the world is solved in a lot of these places and you need to kind of find uh, the area where you can either, if you just do an undergraduate education, just implement uh, what you're taught, or if you do grad school, sometimes, yeah, they'll say, yeah, there are open problems, but you need to fit in, in the empty spots between all of the vast sea of knowledge. Completely wrong mentality. The world is an open problem. There are many open problems uh, still to be understood. So, you know, finding people who, who still appreciate that mindset, because it's hard. It's hard to maintain that mindset. You get jaded so easily. Right. You go through, especially uh, because of how much you know, of your life it takes to even get to the stage where you can start doing research or you can start doing innovative stuff. Um, you're kind of really indoctrinated that this is the way things are and this is how they will always be. And innovation is stepwise. It needs to build on what was always the case. So, you know, people who can actually go through all that you know, see the world as it is and see what, um, you know, people have already done, appreciate it, yes, but also realize that the world is still very open, that that it isn't solved, that it doesn't have to be always the way, same way. And I don't just mean in science, also in 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 legal, in finance, in, in operations, all of these other auxiliary elements, people who can be more creative in how they design things, how they work with people, how they handle resources, whatever, that that ability to be uh, creative and and the same theme we we're talking about be able to grow and, and become different that's an invaluable resource that is really um very difficult to find uh, for one and it's something that you really have to to some degree you have to be a stickler for sometimes you just have to accept you need resources you need people so you need to work with that but if you can really cultivate those, those people with the right creativity mindset, regardless, whether they're a technician at the, the bottom scale or a CEO, whatever, it doesn't matter. But people who can be inventive, uh, that's that's really you know, precious. Um, outside of that, you know, other things, logistics and things like that, their resources are there. I was, that included money and things like that. Resources for people who are really passionate, for people who are really creative are there. They will always be there even in tough times, even with recessions and things like that, it will be there. It will be there. You, you have enough passion for that dream. It will happen. But finding that passion, that's the hard part. Finding you know your own passion and then resonating with others with that passion. That may be the more kind of soft challenge, but hard challenge in, in mm -hmm. a sense. Right. I think uh, something to kickstart this type of mentality, if people think like, oh, am I that way? Am I, uh, can I do that type of thing? Just start asking why of your environment a lot. Like Leonardo da Vinci would keep a book and he had, we, we can see his notes. And he said, why does a woodpecker's tongue look that way? And he'd spend the rest <laughs> of the day thinking about that. Why yeah. does, a, he'd find woodpeckers, he'd take apart their tongue. He'd be like, why is that? And he'd have, he'd have lists of why, why, do, why does Jerry's face list that way? You know, like, why does it shift that way? What muscles are there? <laughs> and if you, if you start with something really small, you'll be like, it'll be hard to shut your brain up. In fact, like you will start seeing it everywhere. And then if you just listen to like what we've talked so far, like listen to where you're being drawn. Like if it's more about nature, if it's more about climate change, if it's more about whatever issue it is, if you just keep, you just keep 
keep doing that down that line. And eventually you'll find the thing that really pisses you off or really excites you to learn more about. And then you just do a mathematical equation. How many people, if you solved that problem, would benefit from it? And how, mu how much would they pay for that solution? <laughs> and it's like, if it's sufficient enough to have the team to build that solution, and you can like make assumptions based on paying stuff like that, then it is a good thing to do. Or yeah. you can just, you know, open source the, the project with a bunch of your nerd friends and your volunteer time and you, you know, give it to the community because you know it's going to affect a large uh, population size, but it just doesn't, you know, generate the revenue that would make it sustainable in terms of its own business. But yeah, I think that's that, a really and, simple way to just start questioning things. For sure. And uh, I would say uh, if you're in this country as well, you're kind of blessed in that there's mm -hmm. plentiful resources. So even if you don't think that this is going to be a slam dunk and you're going to generate so much profit and this and that. There's so many people who can, you know, there's support from the government, there's support from, uh, you know, grants and things like that. There's ways that you can really pursue passion if you can start out with that passion. You have to have that passion for sure. Yeah. The, uh, I'm curious, <clears throat> if you were to build a DIY you in terms of like there's people out there, maybe they're not in college, maybe they're just in a job, maybe they're, you know, uh, working a nine to five and they're thinking, man, I... This science stuff really is interesting, but what is the fundamental knowledge I need to have just to be a part of understanding principles? Is it, would you recommend like, you know, pick up a physics book, learn linear algebra? I mean, ultimately it's what's your problem to work backwards, but if you could think in DIY, how would you rebuild your, <laughs> yourself in a little <laughs> more way? more optimized version of me, huh? Yeah. How, how would you rebuild it for the young people who want to find their way in life? Yeah. So this, this, I mean, we touched on this, like it's, it's my frustration uh, with education in a lot of ways. We're taught very algorithmically. We're taught very kind of closed solution uh, approach. Um, and I lament this. I mean, this is the example I give with, you know, when people study calculus. So we're, they're very much in high school. It's kind of probably now, you know, everybody has to learn it, or I don't know what the standard is, but um, or even you can say algebra, whatever. Um, you're forced to just turn the crank and memorize how to turn the crank. That's it. You're not motivated into why that problem is meaningful, right? You're not, if, if you, I use calculus because there's an, actually a very beautiful motivation, right? Um, you know, when we're taught everything before calculus, um, we taught everything in kind of vacuum, that things are moving, you know, at a set rate or things are very uniform and things like that. When we study geometry, we study shapes and things like that. But calculus is talking about what happens when things now start to vary, when they start to vary yeah. dramatically, right? And if you think about it, that's a fundamental problem because nothing just works, you know, straight linearly. Nothing works, um, you know, nothing has a perfect sphere shape or anything. There's so many things that are have rapid variation and the real world is filled with rapid variation. So if you just told a person, you know, you, know, you were taught all this math, you're not going to be able to use any of it because it's changing too quickly for you. So that's a good way to say, but wait, wait. There is a principle here, or there is a there's a there's a, a mindset here about how to address that complexity. So motivating problems, I think, is is something that is not well done in a lot of cases, and especially in undergrad, uh, maybe it's a, especially in primary school, and maybe more so in undergrad. Um, it depends on what discipline. So if if you're like a college student or something, then some of this comes from I think motivating problems really comes more if you have a mathematics uh, curriculum. Uh, so I was a math major as well in, in undergrad. And, and so that's the start. They always start off with saying, um, you know, let's imagine this problem. This is the motivation of it. Or, you know, what is the, 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 the basic thing you're trying to achieve first? And then you learn the, the, the components that come into that. That's how they motivate linear algebra. So definitely linear algebra is a great course and things like that because of that reason. If it is taught that way, now, there's no guarantee. You can also be taught in the way that learn how to do a matrix, learn how to get the determinant, learn how to get the eigenvalues. It's just like, you know, plug and plug and plug. And for no um, period of time are you ever reflecting on, on the reality of what you're doing or the meaning behind it. So, so there's no hard, fast rule in that aspect. You kind of have to feel like, you know, whatever material you're learning from, is it really motivating you? It should be, that it, it's kind of, it's, it's a self-selection, right? If it's not motivating for you to get into the material, then it's not the right material either, right? Because it hasn't properly sold you on the problem. If you if you want to do a DIY of me, then it's I got interested in the problem because it was well motivated, and you know uh, I have my personal motivations too. But the the types of of logics and things like that, 
it took me a while because I was taught in certain classes with the motivation first. And in certain classes, I was taught with the, just the algorithm first. And I had to take later and really, you know, persevere to, to say, why am I doing this until the point where a future class or maybe on my own, I get that core motivation. So for one, if you're, if you don't have an area that you're committed to, and, and for some reason or another, you have to study, um, then look for problems that motivate you. And I think that's the start of a DIY me, or if, yeah. if you want to call that, whatever you want to label it, something that you, your motivation first, your principle first, and it doesn't have to be science. It can be anything where, where you know, you really understand where that passion comes from. And then look for opportunities that feed into that passion. Uh, passion can die very quickly on the vine if, if you're not in the right environment, right? So if you can say that I want to, you know, study biology or something, but if you're put into a lab where you're just, um, you know, uh, cloning all day long, or you're just uh, part of a small aspect of a big project or something, then you're going to lose that, right? Because, uh, you know, that's not going to, to motivate you, you know, much longer past, you know, that, that experience. And so the DIY me would be at that point recognizing, and, and this is where the comfort level aspect and, and growing comes in, recognizing I'm not growing from this experience. I'm not being motivated by the new challenges and the new questions. I'm going to look for something that does. I'm going to move to the mm -hmm. next thing. So regardless of what your path is, regardless of where you're on in life, if you keep on following that algorithm, maybe that's the basic element of what it takes to be someone like me or some, you know, somebody who who lives that lifestyle. Yeah. When uh, like a fun thing to do, in my opinion, especially with math, if you can figure out why an equation, for instance, exists. If like so if you can yeah. destructure it, like find the like find a real world example of the equation in, in principle and try to recreate the equation from what you're seeing. Like it's it's actually a lot of fun. It it is nerdy, but <laughs> if for people out there who like math or like problem solving, literally you can you can ha like try to have it not just like what does this equation do and how do you plug it into the calculator with the you know whatever to make yeah. it work. Um, if you actually just look at the real world phenomena and think, what are all the variables that are happening here? How would I put it together so I could ca like predict what's happening or, or whatever? Uh, that's a, it's weirdly fun, uh, but at the same time, I'm known for saying that numbers are delicious. Uh, what books would you recommend people check out? Books? Oh, do people do, still read books? <laughs> I read books all the time. Well, uh, so I'd say... Um... I can't say I really have any paperback books because I, I'm constantly, well, I guess in what aspect? Are you saying what uh, research aspects or what motivation aspects or lifestyle? If there are books that come to mind that you would just recommend, they don't have to be related to age and they don't have to be rec uh, related to your work. If it's a book that just moved you at one point in your life that meant something to you, that that's great too. Like Lord of the Rings is a fun one for that because I, I like Lord of the Rings. Um, it could also be a movie. I don't know if you like Miyazaki films. You just, you know, whatever, you know, people are, let, let, this Saturday, this is the, the way I think of it, this Saturday, people are going to sit down and they're going to read what you suggest. It could be heinous. I recommend not. <laughs> well, I so, saw, uh, for some reason, I can't, it's because I read so much nonfiction stuff uh, that- You've hit us with nonfiction, yeah. No, I mean like papers. <laughs> that's, that's all I, mm. I, I don't actually have necessarily- What are a couple of papers you'd recommend? Oh yeah. Well, again, uh, you know, you can do the standard ones and aging and things like that. I mean, the approach is that, you know, the hallmarks that, you know, established or yeah, even, even um, uh, Sinclair's new paper, I think a lot of these things do perspective. Um, but one, one random one I was going to put, it's not a book. It's actually a movie mm -hmm. since you mentioned movies, but it kind of speaks a little bit to this philosophy. Um, and it's, it's very um, time appropriate uh, because it got nominated for quite a few Oscars. Um, it's everything everywhere all at once. So hmm. it's, I don't know if you, have you seen that. that? No, have you seen the movie? I have not oh, okay. that. So it, it actually speaks. So I don't want to spoil it because down. it is a trip. It is a trip. Um, I don't want to ruin any aspect of it. Just, you know, go in blind, don't read anything beforehand, but it very much speaks to, it has a lot of philosophical elements. It kind of even speaks to what I was saying, the nonlinearity of life and, and, you know, how, um, you learn to appreciate and grow around the things and, and it has a lot of philosophical uh, footnotes on it. Uh, but yeah, I think that uh, can be uh, very motivating. Um, yeah. I, I can't, I can't say it's any one thing. It's kind of like an evolved thing. I mean, 
Yeah, I've, I've read maybe some of the standard um, books and things like that, but none of them have the same kind of philosophy that I would say that, that motivates a lot of the progress. It's something you have to build for yourself. Um, yeah. And I, I, I very much lament that, it, you know, go shape your life like mine or go shape your, uh, your philosophy like this book or this, this word or something like that. Um, take elements and hybridize them just like the way that we make technologies or the way that we make innovation, take elements of you, combine it with your environment, combine it with other elements and make your own philosophy. That's, that's the b- best I can say. Uh, otherwise I can't really think maybe I'm just blanking, but I can't think of anything that really is seminal or, you know, read this and it will change your life. Kind of deal. It could just be a good read too. It doesn't have to be profound. <laughs> a good read. Um, I liked a lot of Fountainhead. Fountainhead was is uh, very much. Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, yeah. I, I'm going to say something. I'm just curious what your thought is on this. Sure. I feel like she makes her point in the first 20 pages and then just beats <laughs> you over the head with it for the next 400. Yeah, <laughs> there is there is that element. It's a little bit, and and some of the situations are kind of outlandish too. It's like is I the think she the one... shows yeah different media, but yeah, good. Is the fountain had the one where the guy invents a different type of metal, but then he has to like license the right away the 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 IP for the metal because he loves a woman, or is that a different one? Is that Atlas? Uh that might be. I don't. I don't think. I don't. I don't remember that. He makes like, like a it's new metal. The, yeah, it's the one about the architects. So I think it's a different um, Rand. Yeah, it's it's a different one. Uh, hopefully, I'm not mixing that up. It's been a while that I've uh, read that, but um, it's very much about. Um, kind of philosophies in in progress right because they're so they're all architects and in one sense yeah maybe this this is a good kind of thematic element for for this so mm-hmm. there's there's different tropes and different characters who represent different forms of progress so one of them is very much the in- incrementalist where um he builds on a lot of the the standard approaches the standard ways of thinking and uh he increments and and he is very successful he gets the girl at the beginning and and the girl also kind of moves around from one to another so maybe it's like which is getting better and better i don't know why what, what kind of role there's probably better uh you know literary people than than me to, to analyze it but um the there's that kind of uh, guy and then there's the second guy who is very much also passionate but still appealing to the masses and 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 will still try to develop something new, but still keep it within the the gauge of, of what people already understand. So it's not willing to really go out there mm-hmm. and take a chance. And then there's the other guy who is a complete idealist and does not care what anybody thinks. And I would say none of those three guys is actually correct. <laughs> and those are, those are all great things, uh, to, but they exist as ideals. And somewhere in that spectrum is maybe the healthy balance where you are grounded in recognizing what people want, but you don't pander to it. Uh, but at the same time, you're not so idealistic that you won't accept as things evolve and, and as resources or as as value evolves that you build it for what it needs to be. Um, mm-hmm. But that's, I think, a good kind of read to to give that perspective. I'm sure a lot of people have already read that, though. So. Sweet. No, I'm right. I'm going to read it. Um, <laughs> uh, outside of these nerdy things that you do, uh, what do you do for fun? Do you play chess? Do you surf? Do you play yeah, Go? So- as I mentioned a little earlier, so I do play tennis. Um, yeah. I think physical exercise is always, you know, a good stress reliever and things like that. I play some piano as well. So music is always, you know, that's one good kind of uh, release. But one big thing I love to do is volunteering. I mean, it's mm-hmm. uh, so that's um, really one element that I think um, puts a lot of things into perspective uh, because the good part is that you can say, okay, well, I used to volunteer for high school or something, and I had to go and work at a food bank or whatever, uh, standard thing. But the there are a lot of elements of volunteering that actually are very therapeutic. Uh, for one, if you're stressed about any problem, if it's if you're kind of overwhelmed with all the logistics of what you're doing, or you're stuck on something you can't get that uh, to, to solve, or you can't figure out a solution, it's a great way to get your mind off of it and solve an easy problem, right? This is This is one easy trick, right? You can go and solve someone else's problem that, you know, may involve just as simple as, as uh, you know, moving boxes or, or getting people to register for a blood drive, whatever. All of those things, you feel functional again. You feel that you've, you've done something, yeah. you've contributed, you can do something. And you are also less worried about it because it's not your problem to solve. You're solving someone else's problem. 
So you get both benefits. You get to move away from your problem and you get to feel functional and useful. And then sometimes you get free food, sometimes you get all <laughs> kinds of benefits and perks and swag. But ultimately, it's it's a really cool way. And, and if everybody just put a little time into volunteering, you know, think of about how amazing, you know, so many aspects of life that, you know, we we may not be fundamentally passionate about it, but we could help somebody who is and we can help people in need. And, and that would be just a great aspect if, if everybody could work a little bit of that into their lives. So that's my little plug for volunteering. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be life-saving. It could just be anything. Just volunteer. What's the type of... Um... So if, if you were to recommend someone has volunteered before, what's the volunteering that you do specifically? And they'll just kind of like homage you to like get into it. Oh, okay. Well, um, it's, it's very much, you know, depending on your area. So I, I use different uh, websites uh, that mm. I like to, I like diversity. So I like to do a lot of different things. So I use these websites to just look for random opportunities. So like last week I was mentioning, I was doing a blood drive. Uh, there was one for be the cure. I'll do a little plug for them. Um, they do, uh, they're registering a lot of people, um, for, uh, blood donors in the case that you're a match, you can help somebody with, uh, multiple myeloma or, uh, lymphoma, blood diseases, right? Blood cancers. And it's very curative, um, very helpful, but you know, they have very underserved populations, especially Asians like myself or, or, uh, African-Americans, Latino, uh, minorities as well, uh, need a lot more people registered because it has to be a match. Yeah. And this is different from, uh, you know, your blood type. This is HLA. So there's less matching uh, uh, likelihood. Uh, but yeah, that that was a fun event. And I, and that was at a Chinese New Year festival. So it's, it's just a, a cool. fun, random thing. But then I'll do probably more. Uh, uh, so that's like one off event kind of things. But then you can do more s- consistent things. I like to volunteer at the food bank. I like to wa- volunteer at, at parks as, a lot as well, like, uh, you know, weeding and restoration and things like that. It's a good way to work with your hands, getting out in nature. Um, yeah, there are lots of opportunities, the standard opportunities, but also go for the weird ones. Sometimes mm-hmm. uh, I helped out like in the 4th of July and that was a lot of fun. And I, I got to, um, you know, bring people on stage and I got to, to take surveys and and we got lots of free food. So it, it's just like fun events. It, anytime you go to a festival, see if you can volunteer at that festival. Anytime you go to an event, see if you can volunteer at the event. Um, it's just a good way to get even more involved. Yeah. What, what's the name of one of the websites? Oh, uh, so I use Volunteer Match. That's one example. Okay, that, that's uh, simple enough. Yeah. And then uh, uh, two last questions, which doesn't make sense. Uh, one from the listeners. Uh, this is brilliant. Ad eight eight three eight. Who's at fault for me interviewing you? I uh, had Aubrey Gray on. And he was like, "You need to talk to you know Jay. Have turn bio on." Um, and I was like, <laughs> "Okay." So I, I literally, I was like, "I'm definitely going to ask his question." Uh, can ERA, and this is definitely a turn bio question, um, yeah. be applied as a way to reverse hearing loss? Surprise this. Uh, has been mentioned anywhere, you know, just like the potential to re- reverse hearing loss with uh, ERA. Yeah. So I'll be the first to say that there are, of course, use cases, there are limitations, there are things, you know, where this is valid and where it's not. So um, with a hearing loss, and I'm not an expert in, in ocular tissue and things like that, but my understanding is that you have, um, it's primarily driven by the hair cells. And it could also alternatively be driven by the, the nerve endings that are, you know, uh, transmitting to the hair cells. So Either of those two is possible. Uh, but the hair cell uh, loss is very much an absence, right? So absence is one area where not necessarily reprogramming would be as helpful because reprogramming is, is resetting or rebooting something that is present to a more functional state. If the hair cells are gone, because every time you take a, uh, you know, a heavy decibel um, uh, you know, stimulus that kills these cells, they just apoptose over and over again, then that's you can't restore a population that's vanished, right? There's nothing, there's no epigenome to reboot if there is no uh, cell, period. Um, but you can think about maybe if, I don't know how black and white it is, I'm not you know, an expert there, but you can think about if you do early on, let's say you do have some early stages or maybe in tinnitus, I don't, I don't know exactly how tinnitus manifests, um, but you could have some cases where the cells are there, but they're less functional. Then you can say, okay, well, that could be an interesting target uh, where you can try to controllably uh, restructure uh, the functionality of these cells through the epigenome. Um, so there's that element uh, that's a possibility. Um, and then, yeah, if you, for the nerve regrowth, then there's there's great work, of course, uh, by Sinclair's where they they show that you can regenerate nerves if if that is, is the the source of the damage. Uh, but yeah, it, the other aspect of all of this is the ability to target. Uh, it's not something we've focused a lot on, but 
Um, that's where you have to really think about what kind of carriers you're using and will it be well localized to that tissue? Can you can you uh, target that tissue? And that's a little bit harder. Targeting ear is, especially in that inner ear region, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, so that might be why it's not necessarily one of the, the top docket items. Uh, but yeah, it foreseeably, you know, if the conditions are right for that, um, that form of hearing loss or that form of decay, then you can restore it. Uh, but in many cases, you know, there's nothing to restore. So that's also not possible. Makes sense. And uh, last question is, uh, where can people stay up to date with what you got going on? And uh, hopefully yeah. you'll have like a, either like a newsletter or like you post every now and again. So that, uh, cause that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I am, uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of now transitioned, uh, still, you know, supporting turn and things like that, but, um, now I'm exploring other ideas and I'm working with a number of different groups for the more public facing for other people to reach out. Uh, there's a public benefits corporation. Uh, it's kind of for-profit nonprofit that kind of handles that. Um, its name is we think 64. R E T H I N K six four, and as I mentioned, their public benefits um, they essentially facilitate the collaboration across a lot of different teams. Uh, and the email would be info at rethink sixty four dot com, uh, and then we can uh, send you that uh, post on the website or post on LinkedIn that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, um, we're doing some I think pretty cool stuff. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's a little bit more sensitive uh, now. Uh, but Happy if, if people want to reach out, uh, they can reach out to them and then they'll contact me and others uh, involved and, and approach that way. Do you have everyone on the team that you need or is there some of the specific skill set that you're still looking for? Yeah, I mean, we definitely, uh, you know, welcome more talent for sure, uh, especially as I mentioned, passionate talent. That, that would be a you know, definite interest. So I'd say, yeah, we welcome, you know, we, we love engineers for sure. People with engineering backgrounds. Um, are critical for this problem. For the for the specific skill sets, um, we biologists are great. Um, bioengineering applications uh, for sure. I'd say one um, one area, especially for us in longevity, that is not as well advertised and is equally necessary are chemists. We do need a lot more biochemists. Um, it's something that I kind of learned I know after the fact. Sorry. No, I was just thinking. Like I know biochemists. I'll ask. Oh, you know about, Okay. Yeah. Exactly. I mean that's. We, we think of all these solutions in biology uh, and yeah, some of the cool and, and sexy things involve, you know, genetics and things like that, which is purely biology. But a lot of the standard approaches involve a lot more chemistry, you know, small molecule solutions or even uh, protein based solutions are still heavily uh, chemistry focused. And so, you know, we rush to these problems. We get a lot of good biologists. I, you know, I was physicist and I studied biology to, to study this, but the more I now went into biology, I realized I need to know a lot more chemistry to actually make more solutions as well. Um, so chemists, uh, for sure, we, we'd love to uh, talk with more you know, organic chemists, medicinal chemists, people in that space. Um, but yeah, it, you know, fundamentally, we love to network and, and build out the team. So, Yeah, maybe George Trish can join you. I think he's a pretty good chemist. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe he's looking for work. He wants to transition. We um, might, uh, you know, we might have him try out for a little bit and see. Yeah, you know, he's got to, he's got to go through the paces. You know, he can't just, you know, get the job just because he asks yeah. for it. He's got to work for it. You know, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to have George Church on the podcast the next couple of weeks. I'm, I'm meet with a, uh, a bunch of people like uh, from people like that work at uh, Ginkgo Bioworks and stuff like that. So I, I think a new thing that I've been doing is leaving with a question uh, that you would ask for either people that are going to be on the show in the future or just that you ask in general maybe someone in the comments can listen in but if it's a person that's coming on my show in the future it'll probably be the first question i ask because i think that's fun okay first the first question they ask first five <laughs> okay <laughs> why do you still love what you're doing yeah you can, you can be doing it um you know you you're an expert you you get Money off of it, great and all that. Why do you still love what you're doing? Thank you for joining us today with the Learn With Lowell show. Check us out at learnwithlowell.com. Anywhere podcasts can be found. Subscribe. Tell me what you thought of this episode. Check us out on YouTube in particular. It's a new thing I'm doing. Uh, Timestamps and links are in the show notes. Thank you for coming. And I hope everyone, every one of you found something today that you're curious about to learn more about. And you'll go out and be curious and learn something new. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.